Welcome back, everyone. You're watching Breakfast with Dan and Louise. It's uh, 8.31. Banning junk food adverts before 9 o'clock in the evening and an end to deals on unhealthy food. These are part of the government's new plans to tackle obesity in England. The measures have been largely welcomed by campaigners, but how easy is it to change habits and what is it like to live with the stigma of being overweight? Jane McCubbin has been finding out. It is a national preoccupation. We're chatting waistlines, sir. Waistlines. He's already, already gone up. Got bigger. Has it? Yes. Just enough to cuddle, not too much. <laughs> I like my food. That. This is what you want to get rid of? Yeah. With almost two-thirds of adults overweight, the government says this is one of the biggest health crises facing the country. For Kirsty and Lorraine, it's been a lifelong Tell battle. Tell me about you and your relationship with food. Um, if I'm honest, toxic. I've always kind of been a bit of a binge eater. It's like a love and hate relationship. They've both tried to lose weight, but believe this is an addiction, not a lifestyle choice. One which needs intervention, not judgment. Yes, you do feel judged. I mean, people used to be a fat cow. One even threw a burger at me out the van once, and that, I just froze. I was on the street, happy walking down the road and I just got weighed at one of my weighing groups and they threw a burger at me. I was crushed. No, no one likes to be overweight. No. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's so easy to conveniently binge eat. It's such an easy thing to do with all the apps around takeaways, um, with even when you go to the supermarket, all the two for one deals, all of the um, promotions on sweets and crisps and stuff. And I know people say, well, have some motivation, you know, don't pick those up. Um, but if they are addictive substances, it's hard to say no. To some extent, the government in England agrees. Those ads will be axed before 9pm. The deals will be banned. There are a multitude of reasons why we're in this crisis. For some, like Andrew and Becky, it's about convenience. Because somebody sees takeaway adverts and wants one. Right. For Dawn, it's about cost. It's not easy, isn't it? It's not easy at all. For others, like Tracy, this is a generational problem. All my family big. Are you worried about your weight? Yes, because I've got diabetes now. Let's have a rummage in your bag, oh, you Susan. Be having Go a on. Rummage. No, Go there's... on. But for so many, it's too easy to make the wrong choices. Because we've been working at home... More crisps! <gasps> it's just so easy to go to the cupboard. <laughs> Chocolate! <laughs> but then I tell myself, if I didn't buy them, they wouldn't be there to eat. Will the government strategy make making the right choices easier? Um, so we've got three different recipes that we teach on the course. Adele runs a programme which provides basic ingredients and mentoring to help people eat healthy. The problem is that people, A, don't have enough money to buy the right kind of food. They don't know what the right kind of food is. And even if they bought it, they don't necessarily know how, how to cook it. Whatever the reason for this crisis, it costs £6 billion a year to the NHS. And as a major risk factor when it comes to COVID-19, the personal costs couldn't be higher. So you're going to be mentoring Kirsty, And you've not met her face to face yet. It's kind of quite exciting to get to see her. Yeah. Here she is. Hi, Kirsty. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm really just excited to try all these like healthy foods that are cost effective. Good luck with Thank everything you. that lies ahead. This is a crisis, isn't it, Adele? We need to fix this now. We need to fix it. it it's um, it's it's just not okay the way it is. It's really interesting, isn't it? Well, joining us now is campaigner and cardiologist uh, Dr. Asim Malhotra and also Tim Rycroft from the Food and Drink Federation. Uh, good morning to both of you. Lovely to see you on the programme. Um, Dr. Asim, can we come to you first of all? Do sure. you think this goes far enough from the government? Dan, that's a really uh, crucial question you've asked. I think these are positive steps, but absolutely no, it does not go far enough. I think the first thing to say is that at least there is a, a greater acknowledgement that this problem, this obesity epidemic, which, you know, you've got to remember 2004, the World Health Organization, you know, announced an epidemic of global obesity. And we've, you know, 16 years later, we've not really achieved very much. And that's because we've not tackled the root cause, which is the ultra processed food environment. 
the extent of the consumption of these sorts of foods, um, Dan, which are essentially, you know, nutrient poor, high in starch, sugar, salt, unhealthy oils, for example, is that half of the British diet now is ultra processed food. So we've shifted away from if you go back 30 or 40 years, you know, what happened to sort of meat and two veg or the traditional uh, British lunch hour? The, there's been a cultural shift, but a lot of it has been driven by the food industry who unfortunately, you know, uh, they, they have a fiduciary obligation to make profit for their shareholders. They're not interested in your health, um, but they get away with very misleading marketing. Um, you know, they spend 27 times more money is spent on advertising confectionery, crisps, sugary drinks compared to public health education campaigns. So there's a huge imbalance here. Um, but I think the, the banning of the advertising uh, on, on TV, and hopefully that will extend to online services as well, is a very positive step. But we need to really just think that this is a really a food environment issue. And it even extends to NHS staff. We know tragically uh, 500 uh, uh, healthcare professionals died because of, of COVID. There are different reasons for that. But one of the biggest reasons is poor underlying metabolic health. And one study actually suggested, Dan, that if we had healthier lifestyles, possibly half, maybe more of those deaths uh, would have been prevented. And, you know, that's a really sad state of affairs that we've been in because we've neglected public health for a very long time. Well, there's so much there to pick up there with Tim Rycroft, who's Chief Operating Officer for the Food and Drink Federation. I mean, you know, first of all, what is your reaction to that ban, for example, on junk food TV adverts? I think it's pretty extraordinary, Louise, that after four months in which the food and drink industry has been rightly applauded for its heroic efforts to keep the nation fed, going to work when others were staying at home, putting themselves at risk, that we should be rewarded in this fashion at a time when the economy is in such tenu tenuous shape that we would choose to hit our largest manufacturing sector for food and drink, uh, one of our most successful creative sectors, advertising. And all of this, the advertising and promotions ban, the government says will reduce our calorie intake by 17 calories a day. OK, but let's just specifically talk about, you know, junk food. I mean, why concentrate on that as an industry? Well, junk food is a term that the campaigners have seized upon to describe foods that are high in fat, salt and sugar. That's a definition that was set up a few years ago to define foods that shouldn't be advertised to children. It's quite wide ranging. It includes a lot of things that people probably would be surprised at, like cheese and bacon, uh, like mint sauce and mustard, like olive oil. Um, so the fact is that we're talking here about advertising to adults. We're talking about adults exercising food choices. Uh, the way in which we've gone about helping people to make better choices is through reformulation and changing portion size. Our members have reduced sugars in the average basket by 11% over the last four years. That work is continuing. It, it needs to continue. Obesity is a very serious challenge. But the idea that these proposals are going to make a difference to obesity is completely undermined by the government's own figures. Dr. Seem, to come back to you on that point, I saw you, you smile um, when uh, Tim mentioned the 17 calories. A, a lot of effort to make a little difference. Yeah, I think, but there's still positive steps, uh, Dan. I think we need to do a lot more. So I think one of the things that Tim said, and I've met Tim, you know, he's a, he's a, a very um, respectable, nice person, but he ultimately represents the interests of the food industry and their profits. So I think that, you know, we need to see, we need to realize there's a big clash here of interests. And our job as doctors is to look after public health and, and the health of the nation. And unfortunately, people are being misinformed with the kind of foods they're eating. I think what Tim said that was right, though, and I'll, I'll pick up on the other point that you've mentioned about the economy in a minute is that actually there's a lot of confusion out there about what is healthy eating. And uh, the science has evolved, things change, and the best definition now is ultra-processed food is basically anything that comes out of a packet and has five or more ingredients. What the food industry should be doing, and we know that's linked to, you know, there's all, many studies showing that links to adverse health outcomes, not a single study showing that they're beneficial for you, these sorts of foods. They're addictive, they encourage overeating, they, you know, they, they hijack your appetite control mechanisms. The food industry know that, they make money from it, and then people get fat and sick, and that's the problem we're facing. But when you come to the economy issue, in essence, if you've got an unhealthy population, it's a false economy. We've seen what COVID has done. You know, if the population is not healthy, how can we even have a productive economy? In fact, uh, the British um, Health uh, Work Survey showed that every year we're losing about a, mo a month per employee from sickness. And that's mainly because of lifestyle. Okay. And that's costing the UK economy, Dan. 
£91 billion pounds a year. So I would ask Tim, actually, what is he doing to make sure that people who are employed in the food sector are healthy? Because I can guarantee you the majority of those people will be in poor metabolic health, and they need to think about that as well. Tim, um, can I just put also another point to you as well about, you know, the buy one, get one free, which are mostly on what we might term, you know, not healthy foods, high in sugar and fat. Why, you know, for example, do you think the food industry will come to a point when actually it becomes economic to focus on health and give apples buy one, get one free, Tim? So, so you're not right there, Louise, actually. Which magazine did some research about three years ago, the balance of promotions between healthy and unhealthy food they found was about 50-50. Uh, and it's not surprising that it's harder to promote fresh food because it has a shorter shelf life. So promotions typically work on products that have a longer shelf life. And promotions are used to bring new products to market. They're the way in which challenger brands can get a share of shelf against more established brands. They're also the way that we bring to consumers' attention these healthier options. And the bizarre illogical thing about these proposals is that they'll stop us from advertising and promoting lighter options. Um, Tim Rykoff, Chief Operating Officer for Food and Drink Federation, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Dr. Seema Malhotra, both, thank you very much for your time this morning. It's a fascinating discussion, isn't it, over one of the big things the government are pushing at the moment. A Scottish pilot who